pas si c'est bon ça. Allez, c'est parti. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining the uh, an Energy Sessions. I'm Jérôme François, I'm the co-chair of Energy with uh, Laurence Yavaglia. Um, just to briefly remind you that uh, we are following the uh, not well of the IETF on different aspects. The first one on intellectual property, so please uh, have a look and read the slide. Although I want to remind you regarding the audio and video recordings that uh, uh, the meetings are recorded, just remind you. Although regarding the privacy and code of conduct, uh, really important that uh, you, you read this slide, please. And important also, we want to remind you that so NMRG is a, a research group. So it's part of the IRTF. So we are conducting research. Uh, so the main focus is not on developing standards, but of course we can publish some informational of experimental documents in RFC series. But the main focus is on long, longer term research. Okay, here are the links for the uh, for the meeting today, uh, of course, uh, you can also ha have a look in the, in the notes uh, if you want to add something in the note as well. So here I know a very quick update uh, for, um, for our side. Uh, so as you have uh, seen, we had an interim meeting focused on AI and data aspects uh, a few weeks ago with the main objective to start refining the agenda regarding this topic. Of course, this needs some more step to be refined and there will be more interim meeting on that. And uh, following the same principle, we will have more, let's say, regular interim meeting um, in the next uh, coming month in order to progress in the different aspect of the research agenda of the group. So uh, of course, we will send some poll to find some good uh, time slot training tools to accommodate the different time zones um, in order to have uh, um, as many participants as possible. Also, we want to highlight that we have a, a different, let's say, research group document, uh, and we would like to progress this document towards publication. So in the uh, next week, the idea will be to uh, also assess the maturity of this document, revise them if, uh, if needed, and of course, uh, in order as, at the end to, uh, to go for publication. So yes, this process will be initiated offline through the mailing list. And uh, now we'll enter into the, into the different presentation of the meeting. Here's the agenda. So the agenda is quite full. So we really ask the presenter to really uh, keep time. And so we have see a timer during your presentation. So I invite uh, Nacho for the first presentation. Well, hi everyone, uh, it's good to see you again. Um, this is Nacho Dominguez from Telefonica. Um, this presentation is a, is a follow-up of, of the one I uh, gave in, back in San Francisco this, uh, this summer. Uh, again, uh, about uh, knowledge for us for, for, knowledge, uh, for network management. Um, in this presentation, in particular, I wanted to focus on a very uh, important topic, which is um, semantic interoperability which is something that the knowledge graph can, can help you. Uh, semantic interoperability, uh, what is this? Uh, um, uh, it uh, copes with, uh, with all the data heterogeneity that we may find in the network. Uh, it's about uh, having distributed sources and consumers and, and uh, helping them to understand each other based on, on agreed semantics. No? And uh, in particular, there are two approaches uh, to data management approaches that uh, try to tackle this heterogeneity. Uh, one is data mesh, where uh, it focuses on, on decentralizing the data management at scale. So in this, in this particular case, interoperability is a must, semantic interoperability is a must. And also uh, the data fabric uh, is, uh, is the same story. Uh, it, this, this approach tries to, com to combine uh, data from uh, heterogeneous sources. No? So agreeing on common, on common semantics uh, will allow to integrate data, no? to, to combine all, all of it. 
But to understand uh, uh, semantic interoperability, we must uh, focus and understand what are the levels of data modeling, which is what you see on the, on the right. Um, the first level is the uh, conceptual level, or so sometimes known as information level, which is uh, about business concepts. Uh, it's just uh, uh, how do you deal with a problem and the concepts that are involved in that problem and how they relate to, to each other. No? And then uh, there's the physical level, which is how do you land those concepts to the technology that you are using to uh, solve your, your problem. No? So for example, a, a case of, of the technology that I'm using uh, is, um, uh, is, is Yang. No? Uh, it, could be, it could be a case. Um, so the, the point here is that knowledge for us help in, um, in linking these two worlds, these two worlds that you see in the right, the, 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 that conceptual world and the, the, physical, uh, the physical world. Uh, because uh, knowledge traps, uh, one of the thing, one of the benefits that they, they, they bring is, uh, is they provide a machine readable representation of, of, the, of that conceptual uh, level. No? Uh, this is what we understand as, as ontologies. Also, um, knowledge graphs are self-defining because uh, what they do is they, um, they represent the data along with its semantic metadata. No? So, so the meaning travels with, with the data. Anyone can understand the, the data you have in the, in the graph. No? And also, um, uh, graphs are distributed in nature. Since we are uh, aiming at uh, decentralizing data management, uh, graphs, they pr provide a flexible structure that allows to, uh, to combine data. No? So I wanted to, to, to show some, some examples. Uh, one of them is Yang Library, uh, where we, we see uh, some hidden uh, knowledge uh, in these modules that we should be able to extract no? that, that knowledge. No? So as you can see here in Yang Library, uh, we find uh, some common concepts uh, scattered in the, in the, in the module. No? Uh, one of them is the concept of Yang module, and another is Yang sub module. But uh, what, uh, the difference here lies in the in the relationships. No, so uh, we must find a way to extract this that, this knowledge from from the Yang module. No, in the same line, it happens with uh, with the management of interfaces. This is a typical use case where we have a different uh, Yang modules for interface management developed by different organizations or, or vendors, no? One from OpenConfig, one from ITF, and another for, from vendors. But uh, as you can see, they are totally independent modules that refer to a common concept, which is uh, interface. No? So uh, how, how can we uh, model this uh, or develop these conceptual, uh, these conceptual models, no? the, these ontologies? We have seen uh, uh, multiple development efforts. Uh, just focusing on Yang, uh, one, one of them is uh, the LOT methodology. This is uh, um, a, ma a mature methodology inspired by uh, uh, agile software development. Here, this is a, a more, let's say, manual methodology where the domain expert and the ontology developers collaborate together. And for example, this methodology has been used to develop the uh, the Etsy Saref uh, ontology, you know, which is uh, a standard for IoT. Another approach is the semi-automatic extraction of knowledge. This is something that we have been exploring, uh, where we are trying to extract that knowledge from, from the young modules based on the structure of the, of the data. No? So for example, we could say that uh, uh, statements like young list or young containers could map to entities in, in, your, in your knowledge graph, or uh, young leaf could map to a property or a relationship in your knowledge graph, depending on the, on the data type. No? And there are also uh, other approaches, like the one uh, it's called uh, Maya, Maya paper, um, that uh, in this case, uh, these, these authors are, working, uh, are proposing to use on supervised machine learning. Uh, to uh, uh, identify these common concepts among uh, independent YAM modules. No? And to do that, uh, they do not only uh, process or, or consider the structure of the, of the YAM data, but they also uh, um, analyze uh, parameters like the name using the identifiers of, of, of your YAM nodes, uh, the descriptions, the types, and, and the references included in the, in the model. No?
So this is, this way they, they apply uh, nodes uh, similarity techniques to, to identify this, this common cortex. So these are some, some examples on, on ontology development. And uh, very, just to, uh, to close, uh, what, uh, what comes next? So um, as we have seen, uh, the, the ontology development is a really difficult task. Uh, it requires uh, semantic modeling skills, uh, experts in, in ontologies, uh, but also uh, domain expertise, uh, the help with the, from the, the people that are involved in, in those problems. Um, and the thing is, ontologies are one of the, the, the core uh, elements in, in the creation of, of knowledge graphs. No? And uh, also, I, I've only talked about Jang, but uh, keep in mind that uh, we want to uh, combine uh, any kind of data. It's not only Jan. We'll have SNMP, NetFlow, metrics from Prometheus, all sorts of data. So that's why we need to uh, why we need this semantic interoperability. You know. Uh, so this said, uh, we, we are looking for 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 feedback and uh, from the group and or if anyone is interested in in, in exploring this this uh, this topic. Uh, some ideas that could help these, these discussions. Um, um, one of them is, exp is keep exploring these methodologies or, or toolings that I, that I just saw. No? So if, if, if some could be used to extract that knowledge, that uh, ontologies from, from, from young models. And also we, we could also start investigating on, on how can we um, uh, extend maybe uh, Jang to, to provide that semantic annotation. No? Uh, for example, I, I remember here, uh, uh, a mail in the in back in uh, I don't know it was more than one year ago mentioning the evolution of of Jan it was Jan Bok uh, how, how the author referred to it uh, it could be an option also maybe a separate file containing that mapping to of the Jan data to to its semantics uh, in an ontology or even leverage Jan annotations so, so these are some some ideas that um, that we could uh, we could uh, explore explore no. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey Hiles. So your last two points actually hit about five different conversations I've had this week uh, along <laughs> these lines. Uh, I'd suggest uh, Benoit closest, best person to follow up with in terms of uh, the depth conversation crossing over other things. Annotations are a wonderful place for this stuff to go in the current Yang language. Uh, the for your specific problem space, a module that defines a ontological element that you're trying to say, you know, interface is an example, being able to say this is an interface and then proceed to have references to all the different things that are interfaces across the modules at specific versions. This is an important detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing that gets done as part of that work is also augmenting each of the target modules to be able to say, this is a type of the thing, doing both things allows you from one position to find all related elements. And the second one with the annotations in the module allows you to find other things the other direction. So this mm -hmm. forward and reverse semantic mm -hmm. is very important together. Yep. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. We have other questions to match up for the presentation. If not, thanks a lot, Nacho. Thank we you. Have a very I have to go to the airport. So <laughs> Thank you. We will definitely you. follow up on the mailing list uh, on this work, and I know you have to rush to the airport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you for being here. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we just heard from uh, from Nacho regarding uh, conceptual and uh, um, uh, the differentiation between conceptual and what was the second one? I forgot <laughs> just the name. Um, so basically, with semantic metadata annotation for network anomaly detection, we're going in a very similar uh, direction, but we are focusing on uh, network anomaly detection. And our motive is uh, it should help. Uh, our work helps to test and validate and compare outlier detection systems and should be uh, like a stepping stone going towards supervised and semi-supervised machine learning development. And 
especially uh, as we will see later also, uh, one of the challenges we have is that uh, in anomalies is not something you have a lot. So uh, the more you have, the better. And by actually cooperating with different operators and academia together, we believe uh, helping them to exchange labeled data could improve those systems. And at the end, uh, as also Nacho described, uh, it's not only about semantics, we also need to make it human readable. So it goes towards uh, ontology. So first of all, network anomaly detection, it's about monitoring VPNs or monitoring connectivity in routing tables. If we look, how, how do we uh, manage networks? We have three planes. We have control plane forwarding plane and management plane according to the network telemetry framework. And the control plane and the management plane part is the part which is uh, correlatable towards the service model. Uh, well, uh, we need automation in uh, network monitoring. If you look in the industry uh, today, it appears to be that uh, network operators struggle to identify when changes are happening in the network, regardless if it's operational or configurational, uh, that we are able to quickly identify the root cause. So from a data mesh uh, principle, we are distinguished between so-called operational data products and analytical data products. So to convert that into networks, uh, that means we need, in a network data collection, we need to preserve the, the semantics from the network, from these three planes, uh, as much as possible. And with analytical data, basically the, the meaning behind is we are producing uh, insights, actionable insights uh, towards uh, the service owners or the platform owners uh, within the uh, network operator. And anomaly detection is one of different analytical use cases uh, where the focus is uh, we need to identify changes in a network and ideally recognize whether they are customer impacting or not. So this is not about uh, the intent of the network. So we do not have a knowledge about uh, what is the objective or the, the objective or what is the SLA. It's just about basically automating what a normal network engineer would do when he recognizes looking at operational data. And then uh, when raising alerts, giving him uh, direct links to the, to the operational metric so that he can, in an all-up fashion, start drilling down on the data. We presented at uh, uh, the Applied Network Research Workshop in, uh, in San Francisco a paper what uh, from our perspective network anomaly detection is, and especially also uh, which operational metrics are being used in, in, in which way. And soon there will be also uh, a paper we are going to submit at the ITPLE transaction on network and service management. So we, we need to learn and improve. Uh, anomaly detection system is not something which works from the start. It's something you need to learn over time. And uh, you need more and more data, more and more incident data to actually understand whether you're meeting your goal or not. And uh, once you, and we've been now over one and a half year uh, collecting uh, within Swisscom the network incidents. Uh, and uh, when now the more incidents you have, the more uh, you, you recognize that uh, you need to automate the, the network incident postmortem process. And before you can actually go into automation, normally you need to get yourself organized. Uh, and if we take that le one level even higher, uh, not only uh, taking the context of the network incident within one single operator, you have multiple operators, you wanna exchange data and you wanna do that in a standardized fashion. Not sure Alphonse is raising the hand, shall we address it now? We can, sure. Um, 
uh, thank you um, for doing this automation of alarm correlation and analysis so on. I guess you need as much data that you can get from the network in a way that is understandable and not proprietary to a certain vendor. However, when looking at today's uh, network management architecture, we have domain controllers connecting to the devices. And we have, let's say, just for transport alone, a hierarchical controller, eventually another controller for a mobile network, if it's about network. And then you have on top the OSS system. The information that arrives at the OSS system where you do alarm correlation or and any kind of automation, yeah, is already strongly reduced. Uh, my question is, is this architecture with all these controllers, the stack of controllers, suitable to do machine learning and correlation, or wouldn't it be better to have, let's say, some kind of application doing alarm correlation, which has access to all data one can think of from the network? I would say in general, like forwarding plane, uh, data plane and control plane uh, operational data, is rather straightforward because uh, we, we need standardization to actually make control plane work. So therefore, the, the semantics for control plane are well defined within the ITF. So mm -hmm. I would say the challenge is more on the management plane side. Uh, we have at ITF uh, quite a lot uh, standardized in terms of uh, operational Yang model. But unfortunately, looking on the industry side, uh, there is not much adoption. And that uh, causes challenges. Thank you. Sure. And picking up on that question, uh, so we believe we need some sort of an ontology, which is basically describing network symptoms. And we come up with the categorization of action, reason, cause. So uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the, different, the three different network planes, forwarding plane, control plane, and management plane, uh, looking at the op operational metrics, we see that basically it can be easily categorized in uh, these three areas where action means uh, basically what uh, is being performed in, the, in, in these three planes. So for instance, in the forwarding plane, it could be forwarded or dropped, or in the control plane, it could be an adjacency state change or an update and withdrawal uh, of pass, where for reason, uh, basically uh, here we're getting uh, additional information. So for instance, uh, we are dropping because uh, we no longer can forward uh, because the, the network pass is unknown, where for cause we're getting additional detail, for instance, why it is unreachable. So for instance, because we do not have a next hop or uh, on the link layer level, we are unable to do uh, an ARP or a neighbor discovery. So I have some questions. So first of all, from network, pers network operators' perspective, would you agree that having uh, such insights, so not only uh, know that basically a pass is being withdrawn, but also if you know the reason and cause why this pass has been dropped, would that be helpful uh, for you to identify the root cause more quickly? And then to the network vendors, uh, think about the network process, so for instance, BGP or the forwarding process, uh, would it, is it actually feasible not only to get the action that the packet is being dropped, that uh, a withdrawal is performed, but also to get additional information why, uh, why it's being dropped or why it's being uh, unreachable. And on the academia side, I would be very curious to understand uh, if your research, uh, if you would receive from network operators labeled operational labeled incident data, if uh, your research would, uh, would benefit from them. And in everybody, uh, uh, sim network symptoms, would it help if we start standardizing those symptoms? So if an anomaly detection system is uh, raising an alert and uh, linking to a symptom, we have a clear definition what these symptoms actually mean. 
Hennessy that is Roland in the queue. Yeah, uh, just directly, uh, Roland Blesk, KIT, uh, Academia, that would be super helpful because uh, colleagues of mine are uh, doing some AI machine learning stuff to detect DDoS and they are operating on very old data sets. They don't have any idea what's going on because no one provides the data. So that would be super useful if that data could not be only annotated by what you're suggesting, but also make it, it available. Thanks. Thanks. Any more comments or feedback? Question. Uh, as a participant on this aspect of, uh, let's say, having available data, you mentioned anomalies. Uh, so there is a kind of uh, <clears throat> your situation where uh, to observe enough abnormal events, you need to have either a very long period of observation. This is challenging in itself, but it's uh, real data. Have you considered also uh, approaches to uh, generate uh, cases where you actually uh, generate situation where you inject, for instance, faults, stressing events, to, to, to create data sets that are more representative. But then the issue is how you can make sure that the generation process is uh, relevant for an operational point of view. Mm -hmm. and have you considered the two sides or you are more on the real data and, and get to uh, make them available or also uh, approaches, techniques to improve the generation of relevant data? I think when, when I understood you correctly, it's about like in a, in a lab environment, simulated data, uh, which are properly being uh, labeled. Uh, we have been starting uh, with such kind of an environment, but then we moved over to actually to the real network. And we see this kind of an evolution, like how you develop an anomaly detection system. At the beginning, uh, you, you, you believe that certain uh, rules or uh, certain domain knowledge helps basically to detect uh, symptoms in the network. You're testing that in a lab environment. And from there, you go into the, the real network and see basically uh, how it holds up uh, in there. But uh, there is a difference between what you're doing in a lab, and what you're doing in a real network. And we saw that simulation only helps you to a certain extent. Print. Yeah, Chen Wu. Yeah. So a uh, very interesting work, actually. I just want to point out that there's many relevant uh, you know, work in this space, actually. One work actually in RQT started with 12, question 16. They investigated you know, how uh, you know, use big data to do the network diagnosis, actually focused on network uh, anomaly detection, use uh, you know, theory like uh, uh, time-based uh, similarity analysis or Spatial uh, based uh, similarity analysis to do this kind of this outline, uh, you know, uh, analyze. And uh, so, another work I think maybe related to the concept uh, uh, in the net model that's, you know, ECA uh, draft actually uh, try to model the, you know, uh, uh, some kind of policy control this uh, to really, um, you know, provide a safe management that can provide. You know, rapid response to the network change. So the concept that you say is comprised the event, the condition, and action. So the, the action actually they, uh, yeah, uh, related to this. Uh, you described the, the action uh, cause and this. Uh, but the, at that time, the, the the limitation for this is say they too generic actually, and it can be applied to all the use cases. Uh, the action is uh, very challenging. You may have some misconfiguration, you may, you know, call some action, you make a uh, network device break down, actually, very challenging. Um, but uh, you narrow down the, uh, to the, you know, focus on safer monitoring. So I, I think many uh, things you can do, actually, uh, task-based uh, 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 or periodical-based, uh, actually, we propose, like, a time schedule, actually, this more makes sense. I think they're relevant to your work, and uh, uh, I'm happy to, you know, provide input to you, and. Uh, Looking forward. Thanks for the input. Then I'm handing over to uh, Wang Pingdu. Thank you, everyone. So people are talking about anomaly detection or outlier detection. What is uh, anomaly or outlier? That definition is somehow um, ambiguous and somehow subjective. 
But however, we can always like classify outliers into three different categories that global outliers, which is uh, outside of the entirety of the considered data set and the contextual outlier, which is uh, still within a normal range, but under some context or condition that can be seen as outlier. And collective outliers, um, they alone, they are not um, global outlier, no contextual outlier, but together with some other data point, it forms to some specific pattern and can be seen as abnormal. Um, but um, so but putting this into the network uh, incident context, um, mm -hmm. as we know, like uh, from a single dimension of network or one, from one single node, the scope we have is really mi limited. So it's impossible to tell if there's an anomaly in the network. However, network is connected. So we can, one single network uh, abnormal event was always resulting like abnormal behavior uh, in three different network plan and we've seen a lot of um, symptom. So to address this nature, like uh, we define two different young model. One is uh, young model for symptom that annotate uh, operational data. And in he, inside you find uh, the uh, basic symptom information describe um, what change in the network and what for what reason and cause and which with which concern score or the confidence score from when to when and also the source etc which uh, sources uh, describe which system the observed are layered can be human or can be a uh, software and then we have another young model for the incident um, which basically um, is augmented by the list of symptom that or uh, relate to that uh, single incident. And the source is uh, which system reported that um, incident. Um, so uh, about the tooling uh, during the ITF hackathon with uh, Vincenzo from Huawei, we've been working on a prototype software which called Antagonist, uh, which enables uh, uh, we can uh, visually annotate uh, time series data with the user defined uh, maybe young model. Um, so it can be used in two different ways, like either we create the label and date the data for unlabeled data, and also we can adjust to label the data. As the architecture, um, basically this uh, software relies on the native functionality of Grafana. Uh, which is called annotation. So we can define a template uh, that reflects our young model. And, uh, and we can annotate the time series data visually on the graph on the user interface and uh, send once it's annotated, it's sent to our backend antagonist. It's processed here and uh, generates uh, the young format label as a ground truth. So to, just to uh, wrap up, uh, 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 we believe that uh, especially the semantics and ontology uh, aspect is uh, relates to the work of uh, in, in NMLG. Uh, we are looking for uh, a community or a working group uh, which is interested in uh, what we're doing and we would like to collect your thoughts and comments. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, this work is uh, probably also bringing up some new uh, questions on network telemetry data uh, to bring additional information like uh, cause or reason uh, so that we get better insights into the network. Thanks a lot. Questions or feedback? No. Thank you. Thank you. And we can switch to the next presentation. control to Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect, Peru. 
Okay, so uh, if I remember, do I have the control of the slides? To give you the control okay, well, if not, I will just ask you. So I will begin better, so not to, to delay more the, the, the session. Okay, so what I am going to present here is more or less a call. In general, it's more like a call for help because we are we have been working for some time in, in defining a, a, a framework in general that covers all the needs for, uh, uh, yes, I see now the control, thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, we are defining here a, a framework for, for covering the needs for applying different uh, um, AI methods to network management. So what, what uh, 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 as we know, I will just uh, skip, for example, Let's say the, the motivation is, is pretty clear here. So we are uh, facing uh, pretty complex uh, management situations, management systems, and we need to automate them. That's clear. But uh, uh, for example, many solutions are based on, on just focusing some machine learning solution and things like that. But uh, uh, all, uh, uh, we are skipping the possibility of including other kind of AI services. So many AI services can co cooperate, collaborate in order to find issues in the network uh, uh, and things like that. So and, and also find some way of resolving the issues. So in general, we need to some uh, very strong and, and, and let's say uh, agreed uh, management functions and management form data formats etc so uh, so we are able to generally exploit the, the 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 power of ai moreover this in general this can be assessed with the for example the ndt you know the network digital twin conception and exploitation so we can see uh, by the particular involvement of uh, the the digital twin concept in the network management we find a lot of requirements that we must let's say we as the management system must provide so in general what we intend here is to cover those those needs with some definition so i will proceed with them uh, uh, and before that, I will just uh, in introduce what will be uh, uh, the problem. So here, as uh, from from my discussion, we can see that clearly. So we need to resolve the enabling AI methods to support uh, 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 all the management decisions in the in the network management. Um, side because we are being working in the last in the last years we have been working with rule based systems with human uh, based system but we now need to involve ai and when with ai i mean typically AI, not, not just uh, pretty smart uh, software not just typical ai but we must be able to rely on it not just uh, uh, build all the system around it just rely on it so for example in this case we must to answer how will be <coughs> the data cycle the data life cycle be in the in the uh, view of ai so we are now managing all kind of data from the uh, gathering and analysis point of view but what can we do to support ai services in general, what can we do to support all kinds of data processing, transformation to information, knowledge, and finally wisdom? So, uh, uh, and things like that. So in general, we also must uh, find to the, the evidences uh, of network problems in general, how to identify a network problem. I have seen in the previous uh, speakers that they are particularly targeting some kind of identification of problem, but in general, we must be able to in organize many ways of identify uh, of problem identification and allow all of them to collaborate in order to uh, have some kind of uh, uh, 
composite management decision. Okay, uh, and in general, this is particularly focused, is particularly important for the uh, NDT operation. How can support? How can we support that uh, operation? And of course, in general, uh, uh, we must not forget the possibility to incorporate external data. There are many, uh, uh, in general, I see most of management, uh, network management systems are just analyzing internal data. That means performance data and things like that. But how can we also include, let's say, data from big data services like Let's, I don't know what whatever um, social network is uh, is in fashion today, but things like that we can also incorporate that data and process together with everything in order to have a better view of the network. Okay, so uh, uh, what we are trying to to others here is proposing one framework. I will just skip this. It is everything written in this slide. So because I must manage a bit of uh, time. So what we propose is a, a set of functions and data format for all the management or, or, or all the life cycle of, of this kind of data, but particularly focusing how information is represented and how knowledge, like for example, uh, a previous speaker uh, presented knowledge graphs. Well, okay, they are pretty, pretty uh, powerful, but how are they uh, represented in some way that can be transmitted to other services and how can other services exploit that information from their point of view okay so we try to address all, all of all of that and uh, uh, of course we one of the key focus of this is the ability to compose functions in general not just ai functions but uh, here i can focus on ai functions but in general functions Functions that process data, transform data, etc. How to compose that functions in a way that supports all network management uh, uh, processes? And we propose uh, uh, this composition. And finally, we propose one kind of hub, the knowledge hub, that's extending the concept of knowledge base in order to allow all applications on all services some point a common point where they can find each other, they can find the data they need, and they can put also the data they find, the information and knowledge they find. So in general, this is, uh, we can say that we are aligning this, this solution also in the sense of the AI challenges that are, are being worked in, in the NMRG, in the sense of the action planning. We also uh, try to support action planning by this uh, 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 functions we are proposing and uh, and of course the explainable ai that we all are have been discussing in the previous two three years we are also supporting that kind of explanation provided to the ai uh, uh, systems and and in general we support also the inclusion of the intent based networking so we provide one way or another to include the intent uh, definition within the network management ecosystem within the ai uh, uh, alongside the ai processing functions so we can see that uh, one kind of let's say operational view of this uh, uh, framework would be something like this where we have many uh, uh, services as we can see in orange and those uh, and those services can be for example to to let's say manage one uh, under, uh, underlying infrastructure that we can see here with the uh, uh, in yellow the bim and in general what we do is to resolve this kind of problem let's say we have many flows of information that information is coming from the mo from okay it is coming from the bim to the monitor but it must be uh, uh, shared by to many modules and that information must be encoded in a way that all modules can understand they must be able to exchange information to cooperate in general in order to perform the management task this is not limited only to the internal side as you can see here we have one service that is, is called external so we are also uh, uh, trying to support that kind of external services to be involved 
in all network management. Management. So we need some uh, uh, functions that, for example, to provide in security, to provide access control, etc. So that no external uh, uh, elements will um, compromise the function of the of the system. Okay, but all those kind of functions must be specified and must be controlled in this sense. Okay. Okay, so but we also then have in more also this kind of flows. So we have internal mm -hmm. flows. After we receive the data, we process the data, we cooperate, uh, we make all the services cooperate uh, uh, um, to each other, and then find some kind, let's say, some kind of solution to a problem or some kind of change to improve the network or something like that. That change is then, uh, let's say, enforced to the network. So we have all the services to enforce this scheme is pretty uh, uh, familiar with many, many schemes that we have previously seen. OK, so what we are not trying to revolutionize the network management side, but to evolve, including many services interacting to each other and introducing the concept of composite service on service composition and, and of course, um, information and knowledge uh, exchange among all the services. So at the end, uh, Yes, Maybe you I will need to speed up a bit if you want to have yeah. time for a few questions. Okay, I I I will just uh, just I have only two slides, so I, I will just uh, be fast with them. So we are also uh, uh, this framework, this idea is also aligned with the SCNFP uh, manual, is uh, uh, with relation with external. We are particularly focusing, as you can see here. In the in the construction of on supporting the construction of one NDT that we expect to share a lot of information with other services, so we are supporting that, and and of course we are building a prototype of the of this framework. We have some let's say very early version, and we have been increasingly incorporating more functions to that version. And our goals here in this session are. Uh, uh, to involve other uh, participants of the NMRG with this framework to expose requirements and to share their opinions. And so we ask to, to, to identify, to support the identification of these concepts, etc. We also ask for feedback if, if there is some kind of, let's say, uh, idea to go back and retake this this framework or something like that okay and finally what we are also asking uh, support for what next steps we can see here of course we see many questions that are unresolved but we have more a broad view in this enema framework we have a broad view of all the complexities that will be uh, must be addressed so what will we we ask other people to cooperate and we ask also to involve with questions and requirements so we can, in general, co uh, uh, work together uh, uh, to achieve the common goal of supporting decent AI involvement in network management. I, I finish with that. Thank you, Pedro. We have uh, Alphonse for a question. Thanks a lot for the very interesting uh, presentation. On one of your slides, you had some kind of communication bus over which all the various components um, communicate. Yes, this one, it's called control and management service bus. Within the Oran Alliance, uh, there is a concept called service management and orchestration, and there is an SMOS communication and that looks very similar to to what you have here and my question is uh, have you already looked at uh, the SMO architecture and SMOS communication and how that fits uh, to your architecture no uh, we have no looked Particularly on that, we are uh, more or less focusing on one uh, uh, high-level view. We have been, for example, working with uh, Apache Kafka, that is, for example, yeah. in, in being used as BAS in the in the OSM implementation, uh, and uh, we are also working in some uh, uh, more or less very early prototype of a different approach to a very distributed BAS. 
-hmm. uh, that is internal to our research group, but uh, well, it's, it, it is being published, published, but we haven't no, uh, we have not approached the other bus. It would be interesting for us to, to approach the bus that you that you mentioned. And of course, what we think is that that solution would be per perfectly aligned with this. We are not meaning to just have one single bus, one single uh, 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 system doing everything there in the middle. What we, we target is also being able to integrate all the systems. So if that bus can be, let's say, for example, can be uh, uh, connected together, like, for example, we are doing with Kafka, we are connecting Kafka services with our implementation. So if that bus can also be connected, it will fit perfectly in these kind of systems. Well, well okay. actually, in SMOS, uh, this SMOS yes. communication also yes. uses Kafka together with REST. And so that would be, we have already. I, I would invite that, you to, to, to have a look at it. And yes. this way you could leverage on, uh, yeah, on industry standards. Yes, I will, I will take note. But if, mm -hmm. if it is based on Kafka, of course, it is already supported by our, our view in general. All the functions will be. Uh, particularly well supported in this view. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I invite you to follow uh, maybe offline on the mailing list uh, for the, the yes, next please. Uh, questions. I will look forward to <laughs> some comments in the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you, Lohan, and thank you, Jerome. And thank you all. <laughs> See you. Uh, I think we have uh, one good now. Uh, which one do you want to start first, the distributed AI or the? the Okay, hi, uh, my name is Yonggun Hong. I'm working at Daejeon University. So uh, thanks for to give a chance to present. The first one is AI-based distributed processing automation in DTN. So the first author is Oh Seok Bum in the KSA, Korean Standard Association. So instead of him, I will present. Okay, this is the first presentation in the last meeting we uh, submit, but uh, there is no the presentation of the internet draft. So uh, in this time, we try to reflect the discussion result of uh, the last meeting. Uh, because uh, in NMRG, there are the lots of the internet draft and there are lots of the discussion, but we should focus on some the specific area. So the one of them is the DTN, you know. Okay, this is the motivation. The first one is change of the network complexity and adaptation to dynamically changed network environment and so maximizing the utilization of network resources. So uh, to do this, we want to efficiently adapt to, to the dynamically changed network environment. To do this, find optimal comp configuration of system using AI and D10 and the fine optimal test distributed processing use AI and DTM. And finally, we want to propose automating distributed processing with DTM and AI. Uh, you know the con uh, conventional test distributed processing technique, for example, load balancing, parallel processing, and the pipeline. There are a kind of problem. Uh, you can see the problem. So we identify two requirements for the task distributed processing. One of them is scalability, port tolerance, load balancing, task coordination, resource management, and security. So we propose automating distributed processing with DTN and AI. So uh, I give you some example, okay. Uh, this is what uh, the left side is the input layer and the outside is the output layer. So our uh, intention is to find the optimal operating policy and the find optimal partitioning policy. So to do this, we uh, get input, for example, size of task, number of component, division resolution, network status, available computing resources and distance that we utilize um, AI technology, then we can find the optimal uploading policy and the optimal partition, partitioning policy. Okay, uh, this is my first uh, pre presentation. Okay, the second.
Okay, uh, this is the concentration of deploying a service in a distributed method. Uh, uh, this is the, the fifth revision. So I remember that in the third revision, we got a comment from uh, Alexander Clem, Jeff Tatistar, Jefferson Campos Robert. So thanks for their comment. So in this revision, we update this draft to reflect the use case of this distributed network and self-driving car. Uh, I guess that you are very familiar with this, the SNMP and the MIB. So we want uh, the same approach in the AI deploying scenario. Because uh, if we consider deploying AI services, uh, we can guess the distributed uh, network uh, architecture and the system. So and uh, if we consider the AI services, there are lots of the concentration, for example, accuracy or latency and network traffic, resource utilization, et cetera. So the intention of this draft, uh, the first one is to share our experience and implementation results to find the optimal network system for AI services. So we want to find what is important information to provide optimal AI services. The second is to find how to deliver this information between related devices. So we want to find a common component to provide optimal AI services because this is the ITIP and IRTF. So we want to find common information similar to MIB. Maybe it can be the uh, accuracy, latency, uh, et cetera. And then we will want to find a common system to provide AI service, for example, client and sub architecture. And then we want to find common ETO architecture to provide AI services. And we want to find a common protocol to exchange information for AI services. Also, we want to find the useful use cases. So until now, we showed two use cases. One is the self-driving car and the other is the DPN. Okay, so during our implementation, we find some the possible network computation structure to provide AI services. The first one is using only single machine, local machine. The second is to utilize the cloud server. The third is to utilize edge device. Also, we uh, make uh, network for AI services using the vertical servers or the horizontal server cases. Also, we find three categories of consideration for deploying AI services. The first one is the uh, functional characteristic of the hardware, because uh, if we want to deploy AI services in a real field, the more important thing is the cost. So, so to reduce the cost, uh, we cannot rely on the, the cloud server. We must utilize more cheaper device, for example, edge device or tiny device or et cetera. So there are lots of the variation in the hardware, for example, CPU, GPU, RAM, or network in spaces. So we must consider this kind of the uh, characteristic. And the second uh, category is to uh, characteristic of the AI model. So I'm not actually the expert of AI, but I can utilize of the um, AI technology. So, you know, uh, if we want to provide the object and detection services, we can utilize various kinds of the AI model, for example, two stage model, for example, adoption, and one stage model, for example, SSC mobile cases. So we select and we can find what is the best AI model for this AI services. Also, we want to select uh, what is the best way to AI influence serving framework. For example, we can utilize traditional additional web server, for example, Fast API, Flask, Django, but we also utilize specialized serving framework, for example, Tense Serving. 
The final consideration is the uh, characteristic of the communication method. For example, we can utilize the traditional REST method. It is common and easier to deploy. But if you want to more performance, then we can utilize gRPC. So in this trap, we uh, describe two use cases. One is to uh, self-driving car, and the other is VPN. OK, so it's my last uh, piece. So I want to ask to animal, because uh, we spent two years to pretend and uh, submit in this animal. So I'm asking, is it useful and appropriate in animal? So if then, if yes, then how to develop this draft? In the same manner, why we need to different manner? And any feedbacks are welcome. Thank you. Any feedback from the group on the questions raised by Jungen? At least, I mean, um... I think you, you did the job, as you say, it took a long time to develop the draft to, to get the, the, the outcome of the, the research that you have been developing. So I think we see that in the draft, there is a quite stable and mature work. Yeah. And you have also recently more trying to uh, let's say extend to an application more like uh, AI services, yeah. uh, self-driving core, uh, self-driving network and um, network digital twin. So we can run a probably uh, also a call for adoption of uh, the uh, distributed AI document that has been stable. Uh, for the relationship with the network digital twin, I think this is still an ongoing debate in uh, in an emergency. So I think we can uh, we can see what goes from this discussion. Okay. And I think especially the talk from Albert will uh, give a bit of a view on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hello, my name is Albert Cabellos. Um, I'm going to present um, a presentation uh, related on two different points of view for the Network Digital Twin. And hopefully, uh, after my presentation, I would like to kickstart a debate on what is uh, a digital twin. So, um, before, uh, while preparing this presentation, the first thing I did was to go to the literature and see whether there is a definition a proper definition of what is a digital twin for networks or a network digital twin. Well, what I found was plenty of papers, each one using its own definition. Mm -hmm. it, this was not consistent uh, across the different papers or uh, documents. So uh, pretty much I didn't find uh, an answer there. Um, and actually, after reading the literature, my conclusion was that the, the term has been abused. Um, it, it is uh, defined very poorly, uh, used... Um, as a hot topic um, to, to attract interest for your paper, but not actually taking uh, really seriously. And this is what I would like to, to do in this presentation, right? Um, so no, no consensus has been reached by the academic community, and there is no well-established digital twin definition, architecture, or prototype for networks. At least this is what I, I didn't found it, okay? If you find it, uh, let me know. And you can find a paper supporting pretty much whatever definition uh, you want. And the goal of this presentation is to see whether we can have this debate at the Network uh, Management Research Group. And actually, I think that we will make, uh, uh, if there is enough interest on this debate, on can we define the Network Digital Twin, that will be helpful for the community at large. Because there are many people uh, doing, working on this topic, doing papers, and if we can provide them with a specific definition, I think that that will be great. Um, and in this presentation, I will be extremely biased I will be presenting the view of the authors of this draft, which is also my draft, okay? So I will be biased, but, uh, but the goal is not uh, to convince you that this is the right approach, but the, the goal is to have a, a debate. So um, there are two different points of view so far. Uh, the, the one on the left is uh, the one from a working group adopted uh, draft, which is the digital twin uh, architecture draft. And the one on the right is, uh, is a different one which is the one I am authoring. Uh, just to make, because the, the, the titles are very long, uh, the one on the left, I will call it controller. I'm not, I'm not saying that it is simply a controller, but just to use th this label. And the one on the right, 
I will call it um, the model graph. So this is the same picture, but a little bit more readable for, for the slides, okay? So um, before getting into how each, each of these view work, let me put a very simple example. Let's say that we want to develop a closed loop in network management. Closed loops are, I, I would say, very well known, well established, people understand how they work, right? And basically, you can say that they have three phases. First of all, I collect some data from the network, then I analyze the data, and then I take a decision and an action up on the network. And then this is the loop, right? And then I run again, this as many times as I need. I, this can be as dynamic as needed, and this can change as often as needed, depending on the dynamicity of the network. So if you didn't have the time to read the drafts, I will say that it is fair to say that the controller draft, which is the working group adopted um, draft, pretty much defines the network digital twin as the analyze, decision, and action parts. Okay, I will provide a little bit more details. And the one I'm supporting is that the digital twin is not a controller, it is just the analyze part. Okay, so this is the main difference. So whether the digital twin is a controller or it is just a box to analyze stuff in the network. And actually this model does not need to run in a closed loop. This can be offline for planning. It can run in many different scenarios. I'm just using the closed loop um, scenario to help defining what both drafts are saying. So let me discuss a little bit more the working group adopted um, uh, draft. So um, this is how they present the architecture, where, where basically on top you have the applications that are using intent. They input intent into the digital twin network, which is this um, yellow box. It has some boxes inside, which you can check the details on the draft. And then it outputs control into the network. And then the network provides data into the digital twin. Okay. So um, basically, when I look at this picture, what I see is an SDN controller, right? That works with intent. It doesn't work with any other north, north, northbound interface, but, but rather it works with intent. Um, um, and it is fundamentally the way I see it is, is a controller. The way the, this graph is defining a digital twin is very similar to an SDN controller. And I don't understand, I'm, at least I'm surprised, and I would like to, to understand why the digital twin is tied to the intent. So the digital twin, which can be understood as a vision or a new technology or a new way to push networks, this, this graph assumes that it is tied to intent, which is a big topic by itself. It is its own research topic. Um, and it is not clear how this intent is ingested related to the digital twin or rendered into imperative control, which as I was saying, it's a big topic by itself. Also, it is unclear from this draft how the control signal is generated because at the end, what you're generating is a control signal into a network. And it is unclear to me neither how the models, the functional and basic uh, are used for, for control. So these are the questions and, and, and the arguments I'm putting against the controller view of the, of the digital twin. Um, the way I see it is that uh, the digital twin, it's just a model of the network. And by model, I mean something that can be understood as a simulator. It does not need to be implemented with a simulator, but the way to think very easily is it's a simulator of the network. It's a box that can tell me what will be the behavior of my network if something happens. And if you think with this very simple definition, you will see that many, uh, there are many uh, scenarios that you can fit into this definition for planning, for optimization, for management. So the, 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 the network digital twin is just a model that it is able to answer just one very simple question. What will be the behavior of my network if this happens? Okay. And with this simple question, you will see that pretty much uh, planning, optimization, management, uh, and so on, all these use cases are supported by, by, this, by this question. And again, I'm insisting because I think in the last interim meeting, I was not clear enough. It does not need to be implemented with neural networks. This can be implemented with a simulator, emulator, or any other technique. The point is that the role is, is that the goal is to build a model of the network. Um, I have three minutes, right? For five minute. minutes for questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me go super quickly with this. So um, in the draft, what we have is two, ins two instances of this model working for two different types of networks. The first one is more academic. The, is the one I'm uh, I was proposing, which is for IP networks, which is a very academic way of seeing a pure network, but it is good for exemplifying how this works. So let's say that, let's say that we have a model of an IP network, and then we can ask the digital twin, okay, what will be the impact on the network load if my company acquires company X, 
which means that I will have more users, which means that I will have more traffic. So let me know the model, the simulator between brackets will tell me what will be the performance in, of this network if this happens. Um, there is another instance of, of the, exactly the same way of understanding digital twin as a model for optical networks. And basically in this case, the type of questions that you can ask to a digital twin is, okay, what will be the transmission performance for an optical uh, connection if there are these or that um, conditions? And by performance, I guess that we mean uh, the DVs that you see at the other side of the optical uh, fiber. Um, you can check more details uh, there. And my last slide that I would like to take the opportunity to present is that what it is true is that um, there are very important advances in network modeling recently. And this uh, has become a hot topic uh, in the academia. And the reason is that before uh, machine learning, uh, we had one way of modeling networks, which was the discrete event simulator, NS3, Omnet, uh, or there's one from Cisco, but all of them, they were pretty much the same. They were uh, discrete event simulators that were simulating the network. They were very accurate, but very, very slow. And we didn't have analytical models. And this is very important to understand because if you want to develop an antenna, you have Max Maxwell equations. If you want to develop a wing of an aircraft, you have Navier-Stokes equations. But if you want to develop a network, we don't have analytical models. We don't have equations. We have queuing theory, but it is not very accurate. Okay, so we, there is no equivalent of Maxwell Navier-Stokes for us. So we only have simulations basically, which are very slow. And there are other limitations for simulation. What is happening now is that there is a bunch of papers, super, um, and this paper, the papers I'm choosing are published all of them in very relevant academic uh, venues, like DeepQNet, uh, MimicNet, um, or particularly the last one, SC, RC, AO, o -O -N, that are building new models of the network using machine learning. And actually the last one, I, you can link in the slides to, to go to the reference. I, I, I strongly suggest you to, to read the last one, for instance, if you only want to read one, the last one, because it's a model of an entire 5G network. It's exactly, it's a digital twin. It's exactly the way I say it. It's a model that can compute which is the traffic and signal propagation of a particular 5G network given as an input the parameters of the cells, okay? Uh, and it was used to optimize 5G networks in five cities and well, across uh, in many, in many different scenarios. <laughs> so this is my, my, my last slide. So I'm requesting the group to, to help define, to host this debate. And so far, there are two different points of view, but I'm super happy if there is a third one or a, or a different one. So that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Thank you for saving time for questions. We have roughly six minutes to end all question on this topic. Yes, Roman. Roman Bleske, uh, just a clarification question on slide 12. Yes, uh, are the error directions of measurement interface and control correct here? I mean, that's expect that the data flow is the other way around, but just minor clarification. Oh, you're right, yes, all right. They are, they are, they are uh, in the wrong direction, yeah. Okay, another comment is, is that, that I, I think the, the model that, that you presented is, is a little bit more generic in the sense that you can also use the model to do some studies on predictions, how things work when you change things, as yeah. you just explained, right? Okay. So yeah. you can yeah. also use to predict what happen, what will happen if my traffic doubles. Okay, yeah, right. And um, I mean, the, the event simulators, um, you can use them on different abstraction levels. And one research question is, what kind of detail needs the network digital twin to have in order to get useful output? So if you're, for example, not modeling layer, the link layer and the, the IP layer and have somewhat more abstract flow model, whatever, then the, the performance of the discrete event simulators could be much better, right? So. Okay. Depends on what you want to achieve and what you want to study with your network digital twin and so on. So if you do it on the packet level, that's maybe too detailed. If you do it on a flow level, maybe that's fine. I don't know. That, so the, the, let me answer your question from a different angle. The first thing is that I agree. If you can model 
your behavior with a network simulator, maybe the digital twin in the simulator. That's fine. We can implement it with a simulator. The thing is that for IP pack, for IP networks, a simulation takes. A, I presented this some some uh, ITFs ago, but for, to simulate a, a one gigabit per second link, it will take a, a few hours on a top on a very fast computer. So simulations are very slow. And that's why there are people building machine learning models to speed up simulations and to make them faster. And the second thing is that there are other things that are not IP networks, right? For instance, in optical networks, you, you, there is no simulation of optical networks, but you could ask for a model on what will happen if I change the amplifier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, just just one hint. Uh, there's a, a new data-driven uh, approach that was presented as uh, the SICOM. Uh, it's a data-driven model uh, called DONS, yeah. which is much faster. Yeah. But yeah, as you yeah. said, I and mean, this is exactly the point I was trying to raise. There is a bunch of uh, each year. There is a bunch, uh, a bunch, no, one or two SICOM papers proposing uh, data-driven models of IP networks, which is exactly a way of implementing an network digital twin for IP. Okay, um, as a participant, I'm just sharing some information. There was a 6G net conference a few weeks back in Paris, and there was a dedicated session on digital twin for 6G. Uh, there was an interesting presentation from Roberto Minerva from Telecom in Paris, trying to give also uh, his reflections on uh, uh, how to categorize digital twin, uh, informing twin, I mean, passive informing, uh, descriptive, autonomy. So I think it's an interesting reference point. Uh, I think you can reach out to him also. Well, we can invite him also uh, to, to participate to the NMRG for this uh, discussion. Um, the, the other point I wanted to mention was um, okay, you, you try to, I, I like if I try to highlight that um, there is a question raised to the group. Um, do we see that uh, there could be only one answer and that the views are incompatible or that it's uh, more like, okay, it's still a uh, developing field, network digital twin. Um, and that it's a process, in fact, that we should not try to say, okay, this is the definitive definition and the single one that is, uh, let's say, agreed, but more to, to consider that uh, depending on what you want to do with a digital twin, if you want to visualize, if you want to simulate, if you want to act on the network, uh, there are different categories, I mean, different properties you expect from the digital twin, but they are not necessarily exclusive. They are it could be complementary, additive. It depends a bit on the usage that you want to see. So just to like to get your point of view, if we need, I mean, from your point of view, if the group needs to say, okay, now we need to, to spend time to really come to the most, let's say, settled definition that could really help to guide the industry and the research, or it's more like, okay, it's the debate, it's the discussion that is useful and what we get from that could be multiple uh, forms. Well, I, I don't want to anticipate the outcome of the debate. Um, because I'm sure that they will hear opinions that I, they are not in my head. Um, the way I think is that the network digital twin is a model. And if you want to use it for optimization, it's ex exactly the same model. If you want to use it for prediction, it's exactly the same model. I was not very convincing on that. On the slides, I, I have some more details on how you can use it for optimization, for management, for prediction. It's the same. It's a model. And I believe that part of the confusion comes that we don't have models of networks because there is no... Um, Equation, we didn't run networks with models because we don't have equations. And that's why having a model is something that for us is very new and sometimes confusing. But to me, it's just a model. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we have other people in the line. Uh, Sheng, online. Uh, hi, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, thank you, Albert, for your. Uh, oh, oh. Presentation and bring the debate here. <laughs> uh, my point is that uh, uh, network digital twin is not only a high fi fidelity model. Uh, you know that uh, uh, di digital twin is used uh, not only in network or communication field, but also uh, used in other lot of fields like medical, city, uh, manufacturing, and in that in 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 in, the, in, the, in those fields. Uh, uh, not only uh, models, but also data prediction and uh, control and uh, uh, decision all uh, be included in digital twin for that field. So uh, that, that's point one. And uh, uh, point two is that uh, when we bring twin, uh, digital twin in uh, here in network management or network field, uh, we, 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 we do not only uh, means for uh, 
uh, uh, fi high fidelity model uh, because uh, even without this this new concept or new, you know, this uh, term, we 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 always uh, we have all been always uh, uh, running for um, network models for years, right? And uh, when we bring this digital twin concept here, we want we want to add uh, add the the the, the Closed loop control or the life cycle management with interaction, uh, uh, a real real time interaction, uh, with visualization, with with other uh, decision making, also with uh, uh, control and uh, collection together to the system. So my point is that uh, uh, network digital twin or, uh, can involve much more than uh, high fidelity or network models. That's my point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Next in the queue, Joan. Uh, okay. Havel Huawei. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, in terms of the scope, uh, is there a third option as well there? Because first we are talking, you are talking about the controller, and then you are talking about uh, just well network digital twin without intents. But I'm just wondering uh, for your what if uh, scenarios, like if I don't have the requirements. And that is something I can't get from the network. How could I do some more uh, advanced what if statements, like what would be an impact on my services or on SLAs of those services? And on the, uh, so, so would it be a, a third option or is it maybe already included in your one, but I didn't understand that the intents are part as well of the digital twin because at the end, the closed loop is, has to take intents into account when doing optimization and reconfiguration. So the, the control view of the digital twin, it, it is a controller, right? The, the one I'm suggesting, it is just a model and uh, and it can be used. So I, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Sorry, maybe you can elaborate it again. Uh, you define no, the model as network model only, but yeah. could that model also be network plus intent model? In yeah. which Please, case? Uh, yeah. we, just for the sake of the other presenters, uh, maybe if you can continue offline okay. after the session or on the mailing list. And sorry to cut the, the discussion, but um, thank you for the interesting discussion. Paul? Thank you. Hi, uh, this is uh, John Porjong from uh, Songyang University in Korea. So today uh, I will uh, shortly introduce the intent based networking management automation uh, for a 5G network as uh, uh, another use cases. The, basically, the problem statement, uh, we try to make a concrete uh, some use case for IBM. So even though we uh, published um, RFC about the IBM concepts and definitions and intent clarification. So we uh, needed to uh, have some concrete use case document. So uh, I believe you can see uh, uh, we have you know, the following uh, item to make intent-based networking. The first one is the framework, and second one is the data. Uh, a model mapper uh, between intent and policy data models. So in order to do that, uh, we need to have uh, some intent translator from intent to a policy. And also to provide the assurance of uh, intent, so we should uh, use the closed loop control. And finally, uh, we also may uh, need uh, that audit system for secure intent provisioning. The suggestion for uh, our uh, NMRG, so uh, we get some um, information from uh, other SDO, uh, such as the uh, PP, uh, HG, and ITOT. So we can uh, consider, um, you can see many, you know, the 5G core network and the IoT, V2X, so those kind of use cases. Also, we try to take action on some more concrete some use cases. So I believe we can take advantage of um, security policy translator uh, from I2NS working group. Uh, so um, uh, all of this year we uh, crossed I2NS working group, but uh, we uh, made the security policy translator. So uh, I2NS working group basically um, standardized the interface for some uh, automated uh, policy um, um, generation and the enforcement, we can take advantage of this uh, work. So this figure shows the intended driven management service from uh, 3PP uh, specification. So basically you can see intent user give some uh, intent and then controller translate and then uh, adjust to a core uh, network 
and radio access network. And then we can uh, gather using the talk data analytics function, and then we can um, use machine learning and then give feedback, and then we can control. This is called corrode loop control. So uh, our um, the group tried to make 5G. Uh, you can see this figure. Uh, so IBM user is a network administrator or operator. Give intent, this uh, IBM controller translate and uh, refer to some that talk service function database having some data model mapping information. And then uh, give uh, this policy to so that talk uh, exposure function for uh, 5G network. And then uh, NIF contacts some uh, policy control function and NIF, and then we can provide some IoT device can deliver some uh, sensing data to IoT server. Um, using some required uh, throughput and delay. So uh, I, we can uh, so collaborate. Uh, this one is Songshil University AT, uh, SI, uh, at three, and also uh, this document that we discussed on following thing, I will uh, show briefly in figure. So basically um, this framework, we uh, get some experience from I2 and NSF, some framework. So we developed each interface, a young data model. So 5G uh, network management case, we also adapt uh, previous, the, our experience. And then, so we can make uh, some specific, yeah, then, uh, data young model for uh, management. The one uh, challenge one is uh, we need to provide the intent the translator. So in order to that, uh, given to intent and the policy data model uh, expressed by YAML or JSON or Yang. Uh, somehow we need the data mapper and then we making some mapping information and then we can uh, use it uh, for translator. So this figure shows a translator. So the intent given uh, by uh, IBM user and then IBM controller has uh, that the uh, intent of translator. So, according to these kinds of steps. This draft yeah, explained briefly. Uh, our I2NSF working group has a, a concrete one. And so we have open source project. We have a working uh, code. And then uh, finally, uh, we also consider some the audit service. So we can use a network audit system based on some centralized audit system or uh, decentralized like a blockchain. So um, this draft also describe one uh, simple use case uh, uh, like uh, IoT device data uh, aggregation. So uh, the left hand side shows the initialization of uh, IoT device giving some um, sensing policy. It is called application policy. Uh, and then the uh, right hand side shows some um, sensing report procedure. Uh, we um, define two types of intent type. First one is network intent, such as uh, throughput and end-to-end -end delay. The other one is application intent, like configuration for uh, application IoT sensors services. So for example, um, the network intent, uh, our uh, SKKU IoT lab has two IoT devices. It require um, one megabps throughput and 50 millisecond delay. An application intent case, five, every five minutes, um, report the light and temperature. So those kinds of intent uh, is delivered to um, IBM controller, consider uh, that to intent and the application intent, and then translate. So we can deliver the intent to uh, that to exposure function, and then we can um, measure the sensing data. So this uh, I, ITF 108, uh, my student made uh, some test bed for 5G uh, core network and um, radio access and uh, UE using USRP. So this is uh, the slide for our uh, hackathon project. So the next step is uh, we think, uh, yeah, we need to make some concrete, uh, um, some intent, uh, some work like use case, something like that. Otherwise, I searched for some uh, intent-based work. Uh, many people are saying intent or something like that. I cannot find actual so open source to available to us. So we try to make uh, some intent translator and the PW control law for the, our community. That is my yeah, purposes. So please give me uh, uh, your comment and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Do we have questions? Okay. 
I will. Um... So, so Roland, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you are, you are, sorry, I forgot. Yeah. No, no. Uh, so the, the, um, let's say both as a participant as, as a chair. So um, we have a set of drafts uh, related to intent-based networking in the research group for some time, mm -hmm. uh, especially looking into uh, use cases. Uh, so uh, there are at least three of them. And um, I see in your work that uh, it's both an application, so more like a use case, but you are also trying to make a... Mm -hmm. Uh, let's say a uh, work or an analysis to to say what in terms of models mm -hmm. uh, either from the policy side from mm -hmm. the intent representation side mm -hmm. but also uh, yes uh, from uh, application on the network um, what could be a proposition to mm -hmm. correlate these different uh, pieces so I mean one, one like let's say like like a suggestion that uh, mm -hmm. it will be interesting to discuss with the other Mm -hmm. uh, let's say offers uh, participants that are also looking into the IBN, especially the use case one, mm -hmm. uh, to see if there is commonalities in the approach or if they can use or reuse part of what you are proposing mm -hmm. to solve part of their use cases, mm -hmm. or if there could be um, more like a connection between the use case. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for instance, on the measurement intent, mm -hmm. uh, because for instance, you, in your example, you have a 5G test bed and you have like IoT devices right, trying yeah. to define uh, mm -hmm. connectivity between them. Uh, and uh, the measurement intent is trying to highlight what could be uh, deployed to uh, get certain types of measurements from the network for a certain purpose. So mm -hmm. I don't know if these two work could maybe relate together mm -hmm. and make something um, as, mm -hmm. a, as an output together. Okay. Uh, the other part, which is on the, uh, the proposal for the models and where the, the models connect, mm -hmm. um, this is also interesting. It goes a bit of a different direction. It's not use case driven. It's more about... Um, mm -hmm answering some question about what we have in the research agenda of the group mm -hmm. concerning, uh, let's say, architecture of functionalities that we need in an intent-based system mm -hmm. uh, to make it work. So I think the work is, in, I mean, uh, more like a participant, I think the work is interesting. Mm -hmm. I will encourage to also connect with the other use cases to mm -hmm. see uh, mm -hmm. what, what can come out of these interactions. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. So go ahead. This is Alex Kemp, future way. So yeah, uh, I think just in response to your question, I, I do think actually it's interesting to have this as a use case and I think also perhaps an experience report mm -hmm. basically on how these things can be applied and basically the experiences that you make. So I, I just wanted to express my support. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very much. So yeah, we continue this work uh, next uh, 109 Australia. Uh, we try to design and make the intent also we focus on use case, but the intent translated maybe it's just an open source project, take advantage of this one, we just focus on use case. So uh, uh, please yeah, give me uh, your the feedback. And then this is the initial draft. So we try to uh, take advantage of your command and feedback. Okay, okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And so I wanted to give an I wanted to give an update on the uh, uh, on the draft on challenges and opportunities in green networking. Uh, which has been an, adopt, an adopted uh, uh, draft for a while. And uh, again, just as a, as a reminder, uh, the purpose of this was to analyze challenges in green, sustainable, energy efficient, carbon neutral networking. And so basically look at it, uh, basically address some of the aspects that are also um, uh, part of the sustainable uh, networking um, and so forth initiatives, but look at it specifically also from a management perspective, because there are many management challenges that are uh, that are associated with this. Um, and as part of the draft, we basically structured the challenges um, into these different areas, um, basically challenges at the device equipment level, but also at the network level uh, as a whole, at what can we do at the protocol level, as well as the overall architecture and basically list resulting research problems and opportunities in, in a hopefully systemic structure um, as, as we believe. Um, there've been a number of uh, updates uh, since the last uh, IETF in San Francisco. So we posted the uh, next revision of the draft. 
we made a number of editorial improvements uh, mm -hmm. throughout. We addressed some comments that were made by the list by Kiran. Um, we gave a clear explanation of some interrelated terms. That was one of the comments that we heard, basically, how does green relate to sustainable, greenhouse gas emission versus car uh, carbon footprint and versus energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we also added some references to related work in IoT, who have been dealing for instance, with constraint devices for, for quite a while. And so there are potentially lessons also to be applied to the, uh, to the larger networks uh, at large. And uh, well, essentially, and, and now the main question is basically for us is what the next steps are for this draft. The document is, appears to us as uh, authors reasonably complete at this, at this point. But it would certainly would benefit from more re, uh, more reviews and discussions. And there's a lot of discussion actually on related topics on e-impact, but not so much here in NMRG. And so the question is really how we can uh, how we can bring some of that into the fold uh, into the fold, and how we can get also more feedback from NMRG and specifically also the management and operational related aspects uh, uh, from this. And so that is basically one of the questions: how we can also trigger this discussion. So one of the uh, considerations, I guess, always well, in, a, in an IETF working group, uh, basically the way to get to, uh, to solicit things is to move to last call. I think well, I think the process here is not necessarily the same, but I think that is certainly one, one consideration. And that's basically yeah, what I have on this draft. Um, there's, there was also the question that was uh, raised by the chairs regarding what would be steps potentially beyond this draft and basically concerning the NMRG agenda as a, um, uh, as a whole, but would be some potential topics that we could include for further study here. And there are, of course, actually quite a few of those areas uh, outlined in the draft itself. To me, actually a number of items that stand out um, and that's perhaps also well subject obviously to interest and feedback from the group here. One aspect is this whole area around visibility and instrumentation, metrics and frameworks for collecting metrics and so forth, because basically you need to have the visibility in order to, uh, yeah, if you want to minimize or optimize, uh, we need to have that. There is currently a draft on this topic in, uh, in Ops AWG, uh, which however also still has a number of open-ended questions which are a little bit early for standardization, which would also actually fit a research agenda, uh, particularly actually when it comes to metrics that go beyond the device. For instance, if you look at what's the contribution of a flow um, or of a service instance and, and so forth, how do we deal with conversion factors? Because often we can measure power consumption, but not really greenhouse gas emissions. So there are a lot of questions related to that. Um, a second potential area for further um, research concerns how we can optimize networks for sustainability. So basically, given that we, well, assuming that we have all the metrics and so forth that we need, uh, how can we use this? And so what are the algorithms to minimize energy um, and carbon <laughs> emissions uh, through network operations? And of course, always under the constraint of meeting service level goals, uh, not compromising on aspects such as resilience, elasticity of the network and so forth. And uh, of course, a lot of the challenge there also from a research perspective is how can we take a holistic perspective that does not consider the network and network operations only in isolation, but there's a larger con uh, context, right? So what role does compute uh, uh, place? Uh, where do we place uh, services? What are the trade-offs? Uh, should, uh, under what circumstances is it advisable to optimize for the minimize network traffic versus spending more uh, effort and carbon and so forth on compute and so forth. So that's a big area, um, certainly opportunities there. Um, and uh, just to mention a few more, there's uh, the issue of well, intent-based networking came up in the previous presentation, I think is a topic also for the group here. So clearly, basically, uh, green intent or sustainable intent and control knobs that you can basically operate on to navigate also the, the trade-offs between other operation goals. That is certainly, I think, also uh, yeah, a, a potential area for, for further work. And then finally, perhaps to mention carbon accounting and incentive schemes, aspects that have to de deal with also with uh, perhaps basically providing incentives to users and so forth, how they use networks um, and so forth. Those are certainly also 
uh, topics which are speculative at this point, so worth exploring from a research perspective. Maybe one, I mean, as, as one consideration to perhaps tease out some of that, it would be useful to have perhaps also an NMRG, maybe some joint NMRG and e-impact workshop on, on, on such a topic or so. But anyway, so those are my thoughts that this goes beyond the draft itself. Again, I wanted to mention actually for the draft, of course, the question is how we can bring that one forward. Anyway, that's, that's all I had. Thank you, Alex. So, um, so regarding the, the draft itself, uh, uh, yes, we, as was mentioning in the, in the introduction that we have a set of drafts, including uh, this one, that are kind of stable or we don't receive uh, so much comments. So the idea is that it's in the next, let's say, couple of weeks to maybe reassess about the maturity of all these drafts. You don't have this kind of, let's say, uh, um, formal uh, uh, last call as we are in working group, but yeah, the idea is really to really make progress for this draft if we think they are, they are mature enough. So there will be a set of mail uh, sent regarding that. Um, although I think it's important because uh, as, as you know, as I mentioned uh, in the group, uh, there is a part about this green networking, which might be part of the research and in the future. And so this kind of, this draft could be up also to set this agenda. So I think there are kind of latest basis, docu basis on foundation documents that can help. So yeah, we will uh, certainly uh, 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 progress on that in regards to this. Thank you. So there is any question now for, for Alex? Yes, yeah, so there, is, there is one. Uh, hi, my name is Vesna. I uh, only want to express support for this work and to encourage that uh, it should continue. I'm a newcomer, so I don't know exactly the steps of continuation, but I think it's really important. And I support also the idea of the joint workshop between the E-Impact and this group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. We, we need to recognize that we are ahead of the agenda. This is very exceptional for our group. So, Roland, you yeah, are lucky. Great. You have the full time to complete this session. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, my name is Roland Bliss. Um, I want to um, talk about Kira, which is a scalable zero-touch routing architecture for autonomous control planes. So, in the NMRG context, this fits very well to the, the first topic, which is mm -hmm. self-driving or self-managing networks. And Kira actually provides an important foundation for that. Um, the, the, the goal was to provide a resilient control plane connectivity that you need for all the fancy stuff that we want to do in network management. So especially also topics discussed here like AI-based control, intent-based network management, and so on. So you can do all the fancy stuff in whatever higher layers, but if you are not able to get down to the devices anymore, and then it's quite useless. So especially also important is to avoid any circular dependencies. So if you you always need whatever monitoring in order to control the network and the, the basic connectivity also depends on that, then that may be problematic from a resilient or reliability point of view. And so we have various ways of doing the control like in-band control, out of band, and also hybrid versions. Due to the complexity and, and scalability of the nowadays networks, I think we need more in-band solutions in the sense that they are more flexible and easier to expand. So given the dynamics of modern networks, so we found that existing solutions are not that scalable or zero touch, or if they are scalable and zero touch, they are sometimes topology specific like Rift, for example. So Kira could be also be used as uh, alternative to the currently considered routing protocol in the Anima's autonomous control plane, which is currently Ripple ACP since 
Kira also offers a built-in DHT. I will tell you more about that later. It could also be based for a, a 6G core infrastructure. So what we already did is um, put, for example, open 5GS on top of Kira. And so we had a 5G core infrastructure automatically organized by itself without any configuration. So that was demonstrated at last SICOM. So features of Kira, when I say is it scalable, zero touch, what means scalable? Uh, it can connect hundreds of thousands of the uh, nodes. It is ID based. So it uses node IDs as flat addresses. It doesn't use any locators. So we also have no mapping system from IDs to locators. The trade-off that we get is basically we, we always have some stretch to some of the destinations, but that is first tunable. And we also have shortest path to contacts in our routing table. So in case you're a controller, you basically want to put, let's say the thousand devices that you control with so many into your routing table, and then you get very efficient routes. But to our, all other nodes, you're still are able to connect to or send messages to with stretch. So it is very resilient in the sense that it's loop free even during convergence. And what Kira provides is uh, yeah, IPv6 connectivity. Uh, just uh, without configuration, it is fully self-organizing since it uses self-assigned addresses. And so there are no further dependencies. We found that it works well and across various topologies, so be it sparse or dense like in data centers. And it's also using path-based forwarding. So we can easily support backup paths and also multi-path routing. There's a first internet raft, which is not yet complete, but an update will follow soon. We also have running code as just mentioned, which is going to be released soon. We have to do some cleanup, but once that is done in a few weeks, I guess we will release that code. Uh, so we have code for all the large scale simulations in order to show that it's scalable. We have an SDN based prototype, which is a little bit slow in the control plane, so to say. So the routing protocol itself is not that, that fast um, in Python, but the forwarding tier can forward in 10 gigabit per second, whatever you. Currently we're working on a native routing daemon for Linux using only NF tables. So we don't need any SDN switch for the forwarding tier and it's written in Rust. So the architecture roughly looks like this. We have a routing tier uh, with a routing protocol that uses source routing for its own messages, which makes it quite reliable. And we have a forwarding tier. So all the control plane traffic that you forward is using a fast path, so to say, basically using normal forwarding primitives like longest prefix match and so on. So the forwarding tier is usually as fast as normal data plane routing. So no source routing in the forwarding tier. That's basically only normal longest prefix match and also some kind of encapsulation, uh, GAE tunneling, um, similar a little bit to label switch. Could be used other could be used also other techniques like segment routing, but that's for further study. So the control plane would normally simply only see IPv6 uh, as connectivity. So you can just use your control plane apps directly over IPv6, as we've also demonstrated for Open 5GS, for example. So no adaptations necessary there. So you just can, can use your normal network management applications. We also support, and that's also kind of interesting, um, additional services like topology discovery. So we defined a topology discovery mechanism that uses the features of our protocol. Uh, so you, for example, you only have to ask 4% of all the nodes and get the full topology out of that. So which is kind of nice if you want to make service placement, what have you, it's a very lightweight way of discovering the topo topology. So for example, if you want to do any kind of hierarchical stuff or define areas, you first discover the topology and then maybe automatically cluster your network into certain areas or so. So that's also more in a 
to support more self-management. Uh, second thing that I already mentioned is that we have more or less a distributed hash table on board, which is a very simple key value store and that can be used for, for naming um, since the, the node IDs are typically randomly generated. You don't can't, you cannot really work with them from an application point of view, but when you have well-known names, then you simply look up the name and get the node address and then you're done basically. But you can use it also for service registration and lookup or service discovery. And so what we recently did is also to introduce domain scopes. Uh, normally you have a global scope in the sense that all nodes in the Kira network can just uh, reach, uh, can be reached or reach each other and or if, if you want to use it for, let's say, control in a certain autonomous system, you want to make sure that the routes inside your auto autonomous system doesn't depend on any other autonomous system, which could be the case with the global variant of Kira. So uh, some provider autonomous system could rely on another node in whatever Australia uh, to be present and working in order to, to control their own devices in order to avoid that. Keep, we, we are able now to keep the communication local. So here in that example, um, if you have some kind of domain J, you can make sure that the communication stays inside the domain and does not use uh, the, for example, the domain uh, above. We also support some kind of more lightweight end system mode. So in case you have many end systems to manage, you can also do that. They are not part then of the routing system, but they can use their ID-based addressing. We support multi-path routing. And what we are currently looking at is also security measures um, that you can add. So why am I here? So first, to make you aware of the approach or solution that we have uh, to get feedback, to get support, to get more ideas, especially on use cases. Um, for example, if you want to transport telemetry data for AI, would it be useful to do it using our connectivity? Uh, do you have special requirements? Or also, what kind of other supporting services can you imagine? So the, the box here with the question marks uh, could be whatever, maybe some kind of um, intelligent flooding uh, in order to distribute information or what have you. And as I already said, uh, multipath support is available. Um, we have some rough ideas for doing multicast, but also other stuff that you need, probably like quality of service support, uh, could be added. Yeah, and that's basically the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions? I do have a question. Um, you are a bit highlighting different, let's say, properties specific to Kira in terms of uh, bootstrapping, uh, scalability, etc. Uh, one question I have is about the, for instance, uh, maybe if you can show the slide with the um, the different domains, uh, the logical domains that you can, yeah, this one. Uh, have you already investigated the case where you have, you see like um, some some area islands that get disconnected from uh, from connectivity and rejoin or like nodes or areas? Uh, and if your approach is in fact providing any convergence or uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we, we looked at network partition um, and then, then rejoining. That is basically very easily possible indeed. So, so you will, so in, in case the network split, um, the, each network will have its own connectivity, which is still available. And after uh, rejoining, you will be able after a short period of convergence to get back to the, to the, all the nodes in the other partition. So let's say detaching nomadic networks and then later let them rejoin is, is easily possible. Uh, this is uh, John Porzong from uh, SKKU. So I think a very uh, interesting introduction. So I wonder what is the um, main difference from your uh, the network uh, architecture from traditional uh, software defined network? Looks like uh, you have some routing tier, forwarding tier, also some control, some friend, something like that. So could you yeah, explain the differences, also some similarity between your 
architecture at the end, of course. Uh, okay, I see, I see. Uh, th this is a fully distributed solution. It just, it just provides the connectivity. You Typically, you would use SDN on top of that. So the idea is, for example, that we provide the connectivity from the controller to all the switches in band, for example. Could mm -hmm. be also be out of band, but, but the basic or the original motivation was to do it in an in-band fashion in a very reliable fashion. Mm. So that you could even have dynamic controllers popping up, being able to find each other for state synchronization, what have you, and then also to, to control a different set of controllers. So we have no central routing decision or so. The routing tier is, is really just a distributed routing protocol, which puts uh, calculates the routes and pushes them then to the forwarding tier. This is not for data plane routing. So the idea is that this gives you co connectivity for the control plane or management plane. And the, the data plane routing would be a different thing. Could be done by SDN or any other distributed solution. Okay, thank you, thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay, so if not. Thank, Thank you, you. Roland, for the presentation. Okay, so we are we are on time, so that's perfect. So um, it's time to conclude. Um, I want first to thank you for for joining this uh, meeting. And as we as we say in predictions, there will be a bunch of emails sent regarding the next uh, yes next interim meetings that we would like to set up in order to progress on the different uh, topics uh, that we. Uh, uh, partially covered today. So, um, yeah, stay tuned on the mailing list. And uh, yeah, I would just want to say goodbye to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Also, just to highlight that uh, I think in the last meetings, but also, uh, let's say, uh, months, we try to work on the research agenda. And I think also today there have been presentations uh, asking for feedback, uh, proposing debates, I mean, putting questions uh, to, to the research groups. Uh, so I really invite people to, I mean, the proposers to maybe formulate their question also to the mailing list and also people from the research group to try to contribute to the discussion on the mailing list because I think beyond the hair time that we have in the meetings, uh, we can also use some uh, the more the offline time to be able to develop further positions, arguments, uh, references, sharing the, uh, I mean, elevating the debate uh, using uh, the, the, the offline tool that we have. And of course, uh, we will try also to capture that in the upcoming uh, interim planning to also maybe dedicate specific time, specific presentations uh, to follow up on the discussion, not to get uh, to the next uh, four months before the next discussions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank staying you. Uh, up to the next uh, last uh, session of the of the week. And uh, see you uh, interim and, and the next ITF. Thank you. J'ai sauvé deux minutes au début, il me reste deux minutes. C'est exceptionnel. Non mais c'est bien. Ouais. Est... Eu... Sur certaines présentations, je pense qu'il y aurait eu un peu plus de questions. Mais... Non, ça... Moi, j'avais pas mal de trucs à dire. <rire> non, j'aurais bien. Enfin, je, vais... je pense que je vais interagir sur un mailing list. Mais... C'était avec Pedro. Pedro Thank <laughs> you.